Unveiling the Quantum Universe, Exploring the Ignomatic Ground State of Hydrogen and its Mesmerizing Wave Function. Greetings, fellow science aficionados. Prepare to embark on an odyssey into the heart of quantum mechanics as we unravel the mysteries surrounding the ground state of hydrogen and its captivating wave function. In this fascinating journey, we'll delve into the quantum realm where particles dance to the rhythm of probability waves and uncover the profound significance of the hydrogen's fundamentals, fundamental state. So, by the end of this video, you will be able to construct the spatial wave function, find the radial expectation values, and understand the effect of different coordinate systems. All right, let's see what we're tasked with actually doing. Okay, part A, we want to find expectation R and expectation R squared for an electron in the ground state of hydrogen and express that answer in terms of the Bohr radius. This will turn into a big key later on in the theory. Part B, find x and x squared in the expectation for an electron in the ground state as well. Finally then, let's wrap it all back to part C where we have to find x squared in the state n equals two, l equals one, and m equals one. So this is our second excited state with the varying orientations given by L and M. Before we start, I would like to mention that there is a free companion PDF available for you to follow along. You can access it using a link below. Alrighty, so a little bit of background then. Let's recall that the spatial wave function in totality was composed of a radial part from separation of variables and the angular part which we made into the spherical harmonics. If we conjoin both of these things together, we had a slew of different things and amplitudes, all that kind of stuff from normalization and associated generating functions. And we see that the composite here is wonderfully dense and pretty gross, to be honest. Uh, more of this is shown in the PDF, of course, but just take a look at what this looks like and understand that here, we have the associated Legendre or Laguerre polynomial that we have to find and the associated Legendre polynomials as stated here and here in their combined forms. So this is a pretty hefty task and you might be better off using the tables or a computer to calculate these knowing how hefty calculating some of these polynomials can be as you can reference in a couple of the other questions we've done. But nonetheless, we have to find the ground state, which is n equals 1 and L and M equals 0. So let's go ahead and start that. All right, so then our ground state, as stated, n equals 1, L equals 0, M equals 0, gives us psi of 1, 0, 0, which if we put into our form, here you see that the radial part is composed of a 1 and a 0, where the angular is a 0, 0. Again, we found this earlier in a couple questions before too. So don't be too alarmed when we see repeated effects. What I'd like to point out though, is that at this point, it would behoove you to look at these or look these up in a table, either in the book or find it online. There's plenty of resource because plugging it into that general form that we encountered leads us to a hefty square root that we have to simplify down combine all the factors, and then we have all these generating functions that we're now tasked with calculating, as we see here. All the normalization factors in the square root simplify there. We see that when we were looking at the radial term explicitly, we had this coefficient tagged onto the associated Laguerre, but that goes to a zero power, so we just end up with a one. Similarly, we had the e to the i m phi for the angular part, but that's a zero, so that goes to one. Cool. And now all that we're left with after simplifying this square root down is to find what the associated Laguerre and the associated Legendre polynomials are. So let's go ahead and dive in on that. Okay, so with that, we see that from the definition of the associated functions, we get this gnarly beast here, put everything in the appropriate locations as verified by their color code, and chug it on out. We see that we're going to have a one derivative here with the e to the negative x and x as simplified there. And then we have a total derivative on top of that whenever the e to the positive x can cancel out with the e to the negative x. So downgrading um, the, uh, what am I thinking of? Downgrading the overall polynomial uh, degree. And then here we just have our function uh, coefficient. So negative one lives out 
And of course, all this is detailed more in the PDF. But what we can see here is the characteristics. We know that applying this derivative yields a uh, product rule. From the product rule, we chain rule out of the negative, so we switch the sign there. And then lovely, of course, our e to the x and e to the negative x cancel to one as by design. And we see that we're now left with one derivative, so calculate it through and we see that as kind of expected, either from the table or whatever else, when we have a zero here, we end up with a one term. So that's on par and we check ourselves. Unlike uh, the associated Legendre polynomials, which we have this combined form here, we have a zero derivative, a total zero derivative, so that goes to one. We have a zero pre-polynomial, so that goes to one. And we have a zero in the post-polynomial, so that goes to one as well. So all in all, we simplify down to one. The most simplified state that this could possibly be in for a central potential given the Coulombic uh, traction force. All right, pretty cool nonetheless. All right, so let's combine these into one total function. When we do so, we simplify down to the fact that we have a one over the square root of uh, pi a cubed. You may have noticed that in every other example we did that a cubed keeps tagging along everywhere. That a is the Bohr radius. Sometimes you'll see this denoted as a sub zero. So be aware, same idea, just a different notation. In fact, I think in earlier versions of this book, it was a sub zero. Not sure, I haven't checked, but be aware, that's another notation. Nonetheless, we have a nice, simple uh, poly or polynomial function here to deal with. Okay, so we like that. We can deal with that. Just remember that this is still in spherical coordinates if the R wasn't enough, but that'll come into effect in due time. Uh, we know that we were going to need the probability density in order to calculate the expectation values. So we just go ahead and take the magnitude squared, seeing as how we're all real. That's the square in each part of it. So we get that checked off. Now let's take a second to see what the general expectation for R to some random power is for the ground state. And what we see here is that when we plug this in, we see we get the size star on the operator, which is just a position here on the function itself, no star. Again, being in spherical coordinates, we have the Jacobian for the spherical um, volume element here. And of course our bounds are given as such because we want all space, nothing new. Uh, what we see though, is that our probability density gets here. We simplify down, all good there. But let's make this interesting and see what this means with the expression of R to the Xi. All right, so based on the fact that we don't have any variables in the um, limits of the integration, we split them up into their respective parts. We plugged in the probability density for the ground state. So that's where we get the coefficient here and the exponential here, again, with a two up top now. What we can realize is that the blue integral being the theta gives us a factor of two. The phi integral with zero to two pi gives us the two pi there, wonderful. And we see that the r to the xi plus two and the exponential to a negative r, well, that is one of the exponential integrals given in the book. So what we can do is four match instead of integrating by parts for however many times until we get a recursive relation and generalize it. That is some work that you just don't wanna do. What we are told though is that this table is that we read the power of the variable that we're integrating over is to a factorial degree here. And the argument of uh, what is dividing r, the negative r in the exponential, goes to the power of the, um, of the r here plus one. So that's just a matter of form matching from the book. Not too bad, just be careful with how you read it because in the book they use an a an R over A format. And here we also have an A because of the Bohr radius, not the same thing. Just be aware that that will come into account. Um, what I wanna point out though now is doing this general form, we can simplify quite fast for the ground state only, okay? Here, the Xi plus two factorial, that stays put. But we notice that we have an A to the Xi plus two plus one that goes to an a to the xi plus three, which cancels out with this a to the third power, hence the yellow cancellation. But also this two down here, that goes to an a to the xi plus three as well, but we have two twos here, so that two and that two cancel with this two 
as color code it with the cancel sign there. All that being said is we're just trying to reduce this down very quickly into a general form of xi plus two factorial over two to the xi plus one. Um, and then we have times a to the xi power. Why do we do this? Well, let's dig a little further in first. Here we see the expectation value of R and that gives us one plus two and then two to the one plus one. That's just reading off the form. Gives us A to the one. And so we chug it on through. We see that we get a three halves A and this is three halves the Bohr radius, the expectation value that we would have trying to measure the electron at some distance R. Conversely, what is the R squared um, expectation? Well, we just plug it to one. Doing this integral setup saves us a lot of time, but also it makes you question, well, what about the case for r equals or r to the zeroth power? And that would just be integrating the probability distribution. And if we see that, and if we plug it in, we get a zero plus two factorial. So that just is two times one, that gives us two. And then we're dividing by two down here because two to the zero plus one is two. So that gives us a whole coefficient of a of one. And then of course we have, um, uh, let's see here, we have a to the zero, so that would be another one. So we're confined to everything within inside of r equals zero, but what this can tell us more generally is what is gonna go on, or what we can ask is what happens when we wanna know what the most probable value of r is. Um, and that is actually a question that we see later on in the book. So just be aware, these general forms pop up so you can examine the boundary cases a little easier. All right, moving on then. Part B wants us to now understand, well, what about the expectation of the X value? And this is where we have to understand the coordinate systems that we're working in. Here, we know that the ground state is refined in terms of a spherical coordinate system, so it's a function of R theta phi. That's how we composed it. We did not compose it in the X, Y, and Z Cartesian coordinate system like we did for the particle in a box. So when we're actually trying to evaluate this, we have to be very aware that this X is not X that we know just in plain language. It's the um, conversion to a spherical coordinate. And that's what we see here. So pretty easy to, once we do this, to see how it simplifies out. And when we split all the components to their respective integrals, well, now that our phi integral has something in it, cosine of phi, I think we can see the writing on the wall that this is not going to be anything good. Let's go ahead and fulfill this integral then. All right, as expected, the theta integral led to a pi over two. Our phi integral led to a zero. And again, that makes sense because the integral of cosine goes to sine. And if we evaluate that at two pi and zero, well, of course, you get zero for both of those boundary points, so the whole thing equals zero. And because of this fact, no matter what else we do with the other integrals, even form matching for the radial leads us back to a zero. So be aware that these conversions in specific coordinate systems do matter quite a bit. And similarly, we have a same setup strategy for the x squared. The full setup is in the PDF, in case you were just curious. But now what we see is that we have a theta integral that gives us a four third. We have a, which is pretty typical with the um, spherical integrals over sphere. Um, here we have a pi there from the uh, uh, phi integral section and we form match for the R's here. So pretty easy to deal with. Now that comes the part where we have to simplify. Okay, so here we notice that we end up with a three and an a cubed in the denominator after we cancel the pies, of course, easy enough to do. But this three cancels with the um, four factorial three as we see here when we expand that, easy enough. And the a cubed here cancels out with the fact that we have a to the fifth power, which is highlighted here. So we reduce that five to a two in that cancellation. The color coding on the green here is four times four times two. Well, that gives us a factor of 32, which if we look at two to the fifth is also 32. So X squared gives us an A squared. That's pretty cool. Was it expected? Well, in due time. Let's see what we have for the next part.
Now, in the state of uh, the this would this would be the second excited or the first excited state, yeah, because n equals two, and we see that we have an orientation bound for l equal one and m equals one, and we've solved this before um, in a previous question, but we see that we set it up the same way. If you want to use that generalized form that we saw earlier in the video, feel free. I don't think it's that optimal though when we have old results that we could use. And this book makes finding and using the old results that much more um, easily accessible because you had to calculate this before. Uh, they, they do a really good job of using old results. Uh, but nonetheless, we see that we found this particular thing, not in 3.14, I don't know what I was looking at, but we have a 4.13b. So I switched to three and uh, I guess I was hungry for pie. I'm not sure. But the actual question that we did this in was 4.13b, which I can link below because we did do it. Uh, but what we see here is that we know we're gonna need the probability density. So let's go ahead and do that square. But that was the bonus of 4.13 as well. So we had that calculated already and we're good to go. Now let's go on to our expectation value. All right, so similar thing. We have an x squared, the state of uh, the wave function in a particular state squared over the volume integral or differential element for the spherical um, coordinate system, which we see expanded here. Not too bad. Here we split it up just like we had for the other questions, noticing that our coefficient is slightly different. Every integral has a different measurement or a different um, set of powers due to what was given, meaning that x squared led us to a, a two in the sine squared component phi uh, psi of the state squared led us to another square from the uh, sine and the angle for theta and then here the purple we had a one power there so they all come together and combine into a total power similarly here cosine comes from just the x and then our r's come from the x the phi or the psi and the um, differential element so taking it like this makes it just easier to comprehend and chug out each individual uh, component. Thank you for Beanie again for proving that. Uh, nonetheless, our task now is to simplify down and that's what we do. Clearly we get a cancel of pi and pi from when we evaluate the fee in a row. That's almost always gonna happen so we can get rid of the pies immediately. The rest of it comes down and how do we simplify the numbers. From the theta integral, we get a 16 over 15, kind of weird, but let the symbol lab or another table do that for you. Form match again, we see that R is to the sixth power, so six factorial. A is um, to the six plus one. Um, so nonetheless, let's simplify down. We see here specifically that the 64 from the, uh, one, from the normalization of the wave function cancels out with this 16 times this four. So that's the form matching the cancel signs again. That's pretty cool. Um, we also note that the 15 here can cancel from the five and the three when we expand the six factorial. So everything is coming together quite well. The a over five cancels out uh, with five factors of the a to the seven here. So we simplify down to a two. Notice now that we had a 12 here. This is much, much different than what we had from the expectation in the ground state of x squared, which was just a squared. So every time we go up a level, of course the coefficient is expected to change. That shouldn't surprise anyone too much, but nonetheless, we succeeded in finding out what we needed to do. In summary, you now know how to construct the spatial wave function for any given state in L and M. Although I think we can agree using a computer to calculate the associated functions is much quicker. Find the radial expectation value for an electron in the ground state of hydrogen for any power of R. Again, pretty useful when considering the uh, boundary cases of this. And then understanding how the coordinate system matters and remember to convert based on what is given and what is wanted. That does matter. If you enjoyed this, please consider supporting this channel by subscribing and sharing this curiosity. Books, notes, and other reference materials are found below. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. As always, thank you for watching. Until next time, stay curious.